All right, guys. So I'm Ryan Horton. I'm one of the physicians down at Carson Valley and up at Barton. I know I've crossed paths with a few of y'all, and hopefully I've served y'all well and actually paid attention. Sometimes end up like y'all running around like crazy. I'm originally from Texas, did most of my training there, and then came out to Stanford for one extra year. And then my wife wanted to stay on the West Coast, and I wanted to stay in the mountains, so here we are. So I'm talking to y'all about stroke today. So pretty significant medical entity. Uh, the data I could find most recently was in 2015, so right behind MIs and heart disease is the second leading cause of death. Uh, about 6.3 million deaths in 2015, 11% of all deaths. Um, it was estimated to be about 7 million stroke survivors in the U.S. And that's just including the adult population. So on your lines, you're going to encounter them. I'm sure you see someone just about every day who has a medical history of a stroke. Um, 795,000 strokes are going to occur this year, is what the CDC predicts. One every 40 seconds. And someone will die every four minutes from them. So the morbidity and mortality is quite significant. Once you get them to the hospital, if it's an ischemic stroke, about five to ten percent of those will die. And then if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, forty to sixty percent of those will go on to die. And hemorrhagic strokes, far and away, those kill pretty quickly. Um, so stroke, it's a vascular injury, it's a lack of blood flow to the tissue causes neurologic impairment. 87% of all strokes are ischemic, which leaves 13% to be hemorrhagic. The hemorrhagic ones are gonna have a rupture of a blood vessel, it's typically an aneurysm. So just kind of a diagram image. So the hemorrhagic stroke, you would anticipate a lot of bleeding. Sorry that it keeps slipping forward. I thought I had it set correctly. Hemorrhagic stroke, you're gonna have a blood vessel that actually blows. The bleeding can be small, it can be large, it can present as just a headache, or it can present as someone who's completely comatose. The ischemic strokes typically comes from a plaque. The plaque can rupture. The plaque can form a little clot, which is gonna cut off blood flow. Or that plaque can form a little blood clot that then travels beyond the plaque to another part in the vessel to do its damage. So I was talking about hemorrhagic strokes. This is a patient I had last night, and I decided to throw the image in. If it'll play, like I was saying, I'm sorry, my thing is jumping around faster than I anticipated. Yeah, if you, uh, if you have it on its own timer, the numbers yeah. a little bit, right? But if you have seven in the last few days, or the last one, yeah, he just had like four. ten strokes. Well, and then hey, Hall had one the other day, and yeah, if you have seven on its own timer, you've had a lot of strokes. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Hall told you that. Unfortunately, that like little tingling in the fingers, that headache that's just a little worse than usual, can be a sign of a stroke. It was a codex issue. What's that? It was a codex issue. Gotcha. 
So there's three major types of ischemic stroke. I kind of touched on them. One is cardioembolic, so this is a blood clot that forms somewhere else and travels. Most commonly, we're going to see this in AFib, so someone whose heart is just sitting there fluttering, the blood kind of sits still, coagulates, and the heart gives it a good kick and it travels off to the brain, to the leg, to the arm, to the gut, somewhere, and causes a stroke. Because of the way the aortic arch goes, it's really uncommon for a blood clot to make the turn in the aortic arch and head down to the gut, the kidneys, the leg, it does happen, but it's less common. The first vessels you're gonna hit go straight to the brain. So when you have a stroke from AFib, or sorry, when you have a blood clot from AFib, it's typically gonna go to the brain. People who have valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies, MIs, that can also cause a little blood clot in the heart that can travel elsewhere. Atherosclerotic large vessels, so we talked about that. Because of our diets, likely because of diabetes, we get plaques in the walls of our blood vessels and they get a little more narrow. It's a big thing of cholesterol sitting there. And occasionally it can rupture completely and that plaque can travel and occlude the vessel. Occasionally you get a little ulceration on the top of the plaque and that's really pro-inflammatory in the blood and you'll get a little blood clot that forms there and it can slowly grow to the point that it's kind of cutting off blood flow or that it just completely occludes it. Next is lacunar. And I was kind of talking about just the dangers of minuscule symptoms and that's where these come in. So these are really, really, really small strokes. Can be a warning sign that you're about to have a big stroke. But people will present with all kinds of vague symptoms. I'm a little bit dizzy, my fingers are tingling, I feel a little bit weak, but I can walk completely. And they're the hardest, most frustrating complaints for me as a physician, because you just want to blow off all the 30-year-olds who say, my hand's been tingling and maybe I'm hyperventilating. But there's always a chance they've had a little lacuna infarct. By the way, feel free to interrupt me if any questions come up, I'm happy to them. <laughs> So for y'all's sake, you play such a critical role in the field for stroke and actually getting people the one potential treatment for strokes. Um, and I kind of want to harp on just the important facts. And I think y'all do an excellent job with your histories and physicals, especially given the population we serve. But the biggest thing for stroke is onset. So really hammer down almost to the minute if you can. When did your symptoms start? That makes a world of difference. It can be the difference between a clot placing medication or not. Also important with onset is whether or not they woke up with the symptoms, because that usually is an exclusion criteria for getting the clot placing medication. The one caveat is if they lay down for a nap and they only slept for 30 minutes, and they were normal 30 minutes ago, and they wake up with something, they're still within our window. So really important to make note of that. Don't just say, yeah, they were asleep, they woke up. How long were they asleep for? Keep that one in mind. Medications, super important for us to know. I think like 10% of our patient population actually keeps a med list. It's usually more like the garbage bag of meds. But any blood thinners, so warfarin, Coumadin, Zeralto, Pradaxa, Eloquist, we need to know about that because that again is going to come into those contraindications to giving a clot busting medication. And say we don't know that they're on one of the new novel oral anticoagulants like Zeralto, we come up with a stroke, we don't have that medication, we know nothing about them, we give them the clot busting medication, puts them at a big increased risk of having a conversion from an ischemic stroke to a hemorrhagic stroke. Trauma, if they fell, if they hit their head, have they been in a car accident in the last week, have they seen a trauma surgeon, all really important for us to know. In kind of the like, acute phase, say they have a stroke, they fall down the stairs and they hit their head, I need to know that before I give them a medication that increases their chance of bleeding. Likewise, one of the big exclusion criteria is if they've had a major trauma in the past three months. So, if they were hospitalized for a car accident, if they were in a jet ski accident, if they, God, if they're 75 and they fell down three flights of stairs, that might be the difference between me getting the medication or not. Past medical history, have they had a stroke before? Have they ever had an aneurysm? Have they had a brain bleed? Have they had any neurosurgeries? Have they had a GI bleed recently? All that, again, factors into whether or not I give the medication. Associated symptoms. 
uh, had they had a seizure with it, that can impact whether or not I get the medication. Are they pregnant? Because pregnant ladies, they're at a much higher risk of forming clots. They do have strokes, which can be pretty devastating. But even if they're just 10 weeks along, I need to know that because it can make a big difference as to whether or not I give the medication. If I give the medication, are they going to be able to keep the baby? Okay. The reason I harp on this, the more information you gather in the field, especially if you have a long transport time, you save me a ton of time in the ER. Um, and oftentimes, y'all get a better history from family or people on the scene than I will ever get. So I really rely heavily, and I try to be in the room when y'all show up, especially for critical patients and not just Gardnerville Health and Rehab Transport. <laughs> Past surgical history, so anything recent, again, did they just have open heart surgery and now they've had a stroke? Did someone go in and resect like two feet of their colon? I need to know that. Attention to detail is everything. The more detail y'all get, the happier I am. And if y'all have more details, then we get a report before we whisk them off the CT and get busy. Hang around, see what comes of it, grab me, be like, hey doc, I know I gave you this in the report, but here's extra information, I know it could help you. And as often as you all see this, I see it just as much, so don't worry. <laughs> Field workup, POC glucose is huge. I don't think you'll ever miss the glucose, but hypoglycemia can present with some pretty profound neurological symptoms and it's a quick fix. Also a contraindication to the clot busting medication. EKG, the big reason for this is occasionally folks who are having an MI, their heart's not pumping well, they'll form a clot and flick off a stroke and we tend not to give the clot busting medication if they're having an active heart attack as well, because that's a patient who's gonna to need to go to the cath lab, have a big arterial puncture, and we can't give them a clot busting medication. We'd rather save the heart than, and let the brain take a little bit of a hit. Also, I guess back to EKG, occasionally one of the mimickers of stroke, and we'll get to this I think in the next one or two slides, is a dissection of the artery. So people can dissect that aortic arch, they can dissect into the coronary artery, it can look like they're having a heart attack and a stroke at the same time, because they can dissect that artery up into the brain. So if I see someone who's having a heart attack and also having a stroke, and say they're having crushing, ripping chest pain, I'm much more likely to think of dissection, and that's the patient you don't want to anticoagulate, you don't want to get a clot busting medication to, because the second you do that, they just bleed out. And Vital signs, obviously, hypotense, hypertense into the 180s, 200s, I'm much more likely to think of a hemorrhagic stroke than an ischemic stroke. Y'all are awesome at this, but just take care of the ABCs. And then time to ED, the faster you get them to me, the faster I can get a head CT, the faster I can get the lab work I need, and the faster I can give them the clot busting medication. My evaluation, the reason I show you this is because beyond just a head CT, my evaluation is almost the exact same as y'all's evaluation. So you do 50% of my work already the second y'all walk in the door. Basic labs, EKG, y'all usually hand me when you walk in. <coughs> glucose, y'all usually give me as a, you walk in. And then neurological symptoms, you do a pretty good job of what deficits you're seeing. Do y'all know what the NIH stroke scale is? Is that a familiar term? Okay, so it's a national standard to grade the level of neurological deficits. It's not anything you'll need to calculate in the field. It's something we'll calculate in the ED. But I'll go over it just so you know exactly what I'm looking for. And again, the only reason I tell you is so your physical exam skills are a little more sharp, hopefully a little more precise. I know kind of the big one everyone thinks of is FAST, which I forget exactly what it stands for, but the speech, the arm groove, uh, I forget the F stands for, you'll find out better than I do. But everybody gets a head CT. One of the reasons I leave this, so y'all are going to become part of the ED workup. One of the things we're trying to do at Carson Valley, and I don't know how well my colleagues do it, is not even taking them off the street y'all stretcher onto our stretcher, just trade him straight to the head CT. Hopefully everyone's doing that. Again, that's usually the rate limiting step to get the scan done. 
to get the radiologist to read, it's usually not blood work. So the faster that we can get that done, the better. There's been a few studies that show once EMS drops them onto our structure in a recess bay, then the nurses want to get vitals. They want to start their charting. They want to take a full report from you. They want to get blood work. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes have gone by, and then we have to slowly wheel them over to the scanner. So if we can take them right from the doors, y'all come in, straight to the CT, we've saved 20, 25 minutes, which is pretty big. Stroke mimickers. This is one where I want to see what y'all come up with. Again, there's a lot. So any ideas what it causes it? Hypoglycemia, I already gave this. I'm going to steal that one. One inch. Anything? Oh, things that can be sure. Yeah. Well, you got Bell Palsy up there. Yep. Parkinson's. Parkinson's, yeah. Um, Parkinson's, yeah. Um, Just like you were talking about earlier, anxiety, hyperventilation, mm -hmm. some of pain. Yeah, in the young population, yeah. females, not to be sexist, it's <laughs> much more common, I'm sure y'all see. ETOH. ETOH can do it, yeah. Drug overdoses can do it. So, in terms of neurologic, seizures can do it. There's a phenomenon called Todd's paralysis, where someone has a seizure, well witnessed, they wake up and they've got neurologic deficits. It's not a stroke, it's just the brain recovering. Bell's palsy can do it. Remember, that's going to be a full facial palsy. The way the brain is wired is really interesting. You actually get both the right and left hemisphere controlling one side of your face. So the saying is, if they can raise their eyebrows, you should raise yours. So Bell's palsy, you take out the nerve just before it gets to the face, so the entire face is taken out. If you've had a stroke, you're only going to take out half of the innervation to the face, so it's typically the upper or lower. So say they have a big facial droop, but they're still able to raise their eyebrows, that's not Bell's palsy. You need to be worried about a stroke, especially if it had a really acute onset. Complex migraines can do it, so these are the people who get auras and they might have weakness or tingling on one side, MS, brain tumors, myasthenia gravis. Sepsis can do it, people who are hypoperfusing the brain because they're septic and shock can do it. Meningitis, kind of less so, but encephalitis, the people who are a little bit altered, they might have some pretty profound neurological deficits. Hyponatremia, DKA, uh, people with liver disease who are in encephalopathy, they can look like they're having a stroke occasionally, especially from a slurred speech standpoint. People who syncopize, you get that decreased blood flow to the brain, at least if it's vasovagal. Um, you're not perfusing as well. You can have neurologic deficits that persist. And then people who have hypertension encephalopathy, so uh, systolic at 240s, they can have stroke-like symptoms, decreased vision. They might not even have a hemorrhagic stroke. They're just not perfusing the brain well. But it's not an actual blockage. It's just the pressures are way too high. And then obviously what we see a lot of, malingering, factitious disorder, people who have a conversion disorder, all can present with really profound neurologic deficits. Just treat them the same. Get them to us as fast as you can, and we'll take care of it. So the NIH Stroke Scale, it's a national standard to kind of grade someone's neurologic deficits. I don't expect y'all to be calculating it in the field. It's somewhat time intensive. It takes about five minutes. And again, I'm going to repeat it. So if you give me a good history that focuses on what big buttons it hits, I'm going to be pretty happy. So level of consciousness, are they actually talking to you? Are they uptunded? There's a point scale for that. Do they know their age? Do they know what month it is? And there's no quotes like it's May 1st and they say April. That one counts against them, unfortunately. Open and close their eyes, grip the non paretic hand. Do they have a good gaze? Are their eyes skewed? Is one eye kind of a lazy eye appearance? Really, it's a nerve palsy because of a stroke. Do they have any visual deficits? Any facial palsy? How is their motor strength, so grip strength? Are they able to hold their arms out, palms up, without any drift at all? Same with the leg. Are they able to hold the leg straight up off the bed and hold it for five seconds without it dropping? Can they perform finger to nose? Typical person can at least get from point A to point B without a huge dip or overshoot. If someone's pass pointing, if someone's doing a roller coaster to get to you, that's an abnormal exam. 
sensory? Do they have any deficits? And unfortunately, paresthesias do count as a point in that one. So someone who says it feels different, but I can still feel you touch, that's a concerning enough neurologic symptom that they get a point on the NIH stroke scale. How well can they speak? Do they have an aphasia, dysarthria? Are they slurring their speech? Can they just not find words? And then neglect is a really interesting thing. So that's where you touch both sides and you say, which side am I touching? And they'll only be cognizant that you're touching one side. Um, one of the examples I had a mentor give me in med school, he said it was the most interesting thing he'd ever seen. The lady had had a stroke in a very particular region of her brain. And she would only put makeup on one side of her face. Well, so really like face from the Batman series. So ischemic CBA treatment, this is the biggest thing we have over the last God, 10 to 20 years. So it's TPA. So Thank you. Say, take our, our That's okay. That's all right. So it's a medication. It converts plasminogen to plasmin, and it's an enzyme. It's going to break down a clot and hopefully restore blood flow. It's a pretty dangerous medication. Every time I give this, there's about a five to ten percent chance that someone who has had an ischemic stroke is going to go on to have a pretty ginormous bleed in their brain, and once they start bleeding, it's really hard to stop. So there's a lot of criteria, inclusion and exclusion, as to when I give this. And like I said, a lot of what y'all document find in the field is going to determine whether or not I can give this medication. A lot of risks, a lot of benefits. Someone who's 60 got maybe 20, 30 years ahead of them if they are, you know, paretic on one side of their body. In theory, they could get full function back. Yeah. Sorry, taking it back a little bit with the exclusion, exclusion, the exclusion being like recent trauma and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Are there some more inclusion aside from the uh, the time window? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go over those because I want y'all to know because if you come in and you're giving me a good inclusion criteria, you're saying, "Hey, doc, here's an obvious exclusion criteria." You've done my job for me. I'm gonna, you know, do the workup, but. It's going to be a little less of that panic to get that medication mixed in. If we're not giving TPA, it's completely supportive. So you try and reduce risk, you're giving them aspirin, you're reducing their cholesterol, and essentially trying to rehab the deficits that they've got. Um, one of the big things about TPA, it's time sensitive. They found it's kind of like a heart attack where we say time is muscle. Time is brain, so the sooner I get that medication in there, I break up that clot, the sooner they're going to get blood flow back, they might retain a little bit of function that they'd otherwise lose if I gave it 30 minutes later. So criteria, again, I want you all to know it. Inclusion criteria, they have to be over 18. Very, very, very rarely they'll give it to kiddos, but that's a pretty rare circumstance, and that's going to be a crappy case for all involved. They have to have a diagnosis of an ischemic stroke with the deficit. So the reason we say a deficit is someone who had neurologic symptoms for y'all in the field, if they get to me and they're completely resolved, no reason to give them the clot busting medication. I'm just going to increase their risk of a bleed with no potential benefit. And then the reason an ischemic stroke is an important diagnosis, we all we get a head CT in all these patients to look for bleeding around the brain. Because if they've had a hemorrhagic stroke, absolutely do not get the clot busting medication. And then the big thing is time, and I kind of hit on this with the onset. So the gold standard used to be three hours, 180 minutes from the time of onset I had to give the medication. There's been a few studies within the last five years, pretty recently now, four and a half hours in a really select patient population. Um, and then there's another treatment that goes out to 24 hours for a very select stroke. The big thing, get them to me and have a good time of onset. But if you want to tell me, hey, this occurred five hours ago, it's going to change how I approach the patient. Exclusion criteria, and there's a lot more of these. So obviously, if they have blood around the brain, we're not going to give it. If they've had any neurosurgical procedures, if they've had any severe head trauma where they were hospitalized, and if they've had a stroke three months prior, that increases their risk of bleeding. They do not get the clot busting medication. If they have uncontrolled hypertension, it's an exclusion criteria, but I put a little star on this one because I can treat their blood pressure, bring it down, and then they'll qualify for the medication. So just because someone's got a systolic of 200 doesn't mean they're out the door, it just means I gotta hit them hard with some anti 
if they've had bleeding around the burning before, if they've had a tumor, or if they have a tumor, it may be malformation, if they have an aneurysm, they don't get it. Active internal bleeding, and this isn't just like a GI bleed or a lady on her period. This is someone who, for whatever reason, they're in a car accident, they come in with strip light symptoms, they have a ruptured spleen, they have a liver injury, they have a renal contusion or a renal injury, they're not going to get it, obviously. Someone who has endocarditis, so it's a pretty interesting population, it's a little bit rare, but if you get that heroin addict who shoots three times a day for the past five years, and he tells you, yeah, they're treating me for endocarditis, I'd be so impressed if heroin addict actually told you all that, <laughs> but they're going to be uh, excluded from this, because likely their stroke is from flicking off a little septic emboli of bacteria, and not a blood clot. So the clot busting medication does nothing for them. Blood glucose less than 50, we don't give yeah. them the clot busting yeah. medication because likely their yeah. symptoms are from hypoglycemia. And then if they have a propensity to bleed, so I talked about in the history of those medications. So platelets less than 100, I'm going to get that before I give them the medication. And then if they've had warfarin on board, so warfarin recombinant, if their INR is elevated, that's an exclusion. And then the NOAX, which is that the beta trend, the Roxaban, the Zeralto, Eliquis, Pradaxa. If they have those medications on their list and they're taking it, I will not give them this medication. So going back just uh, yeah. to confirm yeah. uh, the second one there, uh -huh. severe head trauma or stroke three months prior. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, understanding was any prior history of stroke, they're no longer a candidate. So, so a previous stroke can be a candidate if it's they, more than three months. They can, yeah. Oh, so okay. if it's been six months, they're still a potential candidate. Okay. Um, it does increase their risk of a bleed to have had any past stroke, just because it's already that damaged brain tissue. But we will consider it. Okay. Yeah. Oftentimes, if someone's had a stroke, say, in the last six months to a year, I'm going to get a neurologist on the phone and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing on the head CT. Here's how old the patient is. There are other risk factors. Would you give it to them? I'm not going to hang my medical license completely on my own. I'm going to let someone else hop in. Yes? So you back off that. How does, whether it be six months, a year, two years, how does previous TPA affect given TPA in the future? Yeah, so previous TPA use doesn't matter for future TPA use at all. It's actually metabolized pretty quickly, so I think within the hour of the last administration, it's completely out of your system, so it has no impact in the future. How about for the time frames? Yes. Yeah. Like, so if they pass that window, what's the, treat what's the next treatment plan that you guys
it is it good for us to be aggressive with airway management as far as innovating just to protect like knowing that they're probably gonna end up vomiting at some point yeah. to get in there and if try to protect their airway. Y'all are way south or the weather's horrible out, it's gonna be a thirty minute transport. Mm -hmm. I've got no problem for someone who has a blown pupil or GCS three. Mm -hmm. Innovate them. I'm for it's sure gonna not going to do it. Easier. If it's a quick transport, I'm just going to bring them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Quick transport, no big deal. Give them to me. I'll do it. But if it's a long transport, if the weather's crappy, I've got zero problem because you're going to do them a lot of good mm -hmm. for very little risk at that point. Mm -hmm. People have I just had an MI in the past few weeks. I might think twice about giving them CPA. And then we talked about that four and a half hour window. So we kind of narrowed down our criteria to give TPA. So people who are old, greater than 80, much higher risk of bleeding, we don't give it to them. Greater than three hours out. History of a prior stroke and diabetes. So I don't know your name, but you were asking about prior stroke. So if they're more than three hours out, they've got history of a stroke and they've got diabetes, studies have shown if you give them the TPA, they're much more likely to bleed, so we don't do it then. Any anticoagulant use, so I talked about Coumadin and Warfarin, and then their lab test, that INR being greater than 1.7. So if they're more than three hours out, but under four and a half hours, if they take Coumadin, but they're subtherapeutic, their INR is like 1.5, they still don't get the clot and the medication. NIH stroke scale, goes from zero up to, I think, 30, if it's greater than 25, so just massive deficits, that person is much more likely to bleed, so I won't give it to them. And then if they've got infarcts in multiple places, so the front right, the back right, front left, I won't give it to them because they're more likely to bleed. Post-TPA transport, so if I can't fly patients, I appreciate y'all's <laughs> services. So I give them TPA, the weather's crummy, and you got an hour up to Renown to get them to a place with a neurosurgeon. Biggest thing is try and protect that head. Don't let them fall off the stretcher. <laughs> Watch out for the speed bumps. Any little damage puts, uh, puts them at a much higher risk of bleeding. And when they bleed around the brain, it's bad. Monitor for neurological improvement. When you get to Renown, they're going to want to know what deficits did they start with when they left Parson Valley, and how are they doing now? If in transport, they're like, hey, I can use my arm again. You want to take note of that. You can document the time because there's a neurologist who's super nerdy and is going to love to know exactly when their improvements started to happen. And then the thing that's kind of scary is when they get worse. So I gave them TPA 30 minutes ago. Y'all pick them up, you start to drive. 10 minutes out the door, they're like, oh, my head hurts. And then they vomit, and then they start to kind of fade. You should be thinking that they've got bleeding around the brain, and kind of the worst case scenario has happened. Depending upon where you are in the valley, you might consider stopping off at Carson Tahoe and say, hey, it was a TPA transport, and now we're unfunded need an airway, need to get scanned again, because likely they've had a bleed, and those are pretty hard to manage, as expected. Um, yeah. It's not the road you want to travel down. <laughs> TIAs, so special patient populations, so someone who has neuro deficits that completely resolve, again, that's an exclusion criteria for TPA. Um, important for y'all to know about, obviously you're going to bring them in to me, but there's a pretty high risk of going on to develop a stroke within the next 24 hours after one of these sentinel events. So oftentimes these patients get hospitalized. You should consider it like a brain attack or like angina for the heart. Someone who's saying, I have chest pain but their EKG is okay and they don't end up with an elevated troponin. They still could have a pretty big blockage in the heart. Same thing with the brain. So. I talked about those plaques building up and narrowing that blood supply. So you can get a pretty narrow little lumen, and if someone, say, gets up to walk from the couch uh, to the kitchen and their heart rate gets up, and because of the flow forces they're not getting blood past that little blockage, they might have narrow deficits that when they sit down, completely resolve. That should be a patient that scares you all and they scare me. So in the old days, uh, 20 years ago, we used to see patients who we'd call a TIA, they had symptoms, they completely resolved, and we say, oh, it's a TIA. Those patients actually ended up having strokes. We just didn't have the technology to see it, the MRI is one is good. 
So nowadays, we're pretty good at finding strokes. If someone comes in, has a weakness of the left arm that completely resolves, we're going to get an MRI. If the MRI shows us a stroke, they've had a stroke. If the MRI is completely normal, that's when they come back into that TIA category. So there can be no radiographic evidence for CDAs. There's still a lot of TIAs in America each year. Like I was saying, 10% of patients who have a TIA, they'll go on to have a stroke. Most, like 5% are within two days of that sentinel event, and then 10% are in, in the next three months. Unfortunately, the treatment for a TIA is pretty limited. It's just aspirin, getting control of the blood sugar if they're diabetic, making sure their blood pressure is controlled, getting them on the stat. Hemorrhagic stroke treatment. Y'all oftentimes are called upon to transport these patients. Like you've noticed, they're vomiting, they're tonded, they're just kind of a mess of a patient. Ultimately, we've got to get them somewhere that has neurosurgery, where they can go in and potentially evacuate a big blood clot that's compressing their brain, potentially go in and clip an aneurysm so it stops bleeding. Um, approach to treatment, there's not a lot I can do at Carson Valley, there's not a lot I can do at Barton. It's supportive until I get into that neurosurgeon. It's clipping that aneurysm, it's coiling it, it's putting in a drain, it's taking off a part of the skull to evacuate the clot. They need a neurosurgeon. High risk of dying during transport, especially if we can't fly, that hour drive is a little bit scary. The more swelling you get on the brain compressing it, the slower their heart rate's going to get, the more they're going to brady and eventually just go ace the stomach running. So certainly a very real risk. If you're transporting one of these patients and they go asystolic on you, don't feel bad. The mortality was already super high. Follow your protocols, whether that's stopping at CTH to let them pronounce them or just driving faster to run out. Is, is there any, I remember learning about if you could potentially over oxygenate patients and cause like more vasoconstriction or vasodilation or uh, yeah. what? Yeah. I mean, so is there, we don't want to just give them oxygen yeah. just because they're having a big event. Yeah. Like, we don't really want to maintain their stats high more, right. like on the lower end, right? Yeah. Like 90 to 95. Yeah. So if they're starting fine on room air, just let them be on room air. If they are hypoxic, put them on enough oxygen to get them to like 92 to 95. That's not the patient you want to blast with 5, 10 liters and come up to 100% because there's some oxidative stress from having too much oxygen in the bloodstream. So definitely a thing. And then the other question that I had with at least with patients that have a bleed, um, uh -huh. that like if they're complaining of a headache, mm -hmm. a severe headache, is giving them narcotics and let's say they maybe even a little bit ad had a few pretty agitated mm -hmm. stroke patients. Yeah. Giving them a versed. No problem. No problem. And then fentanyl will that help decrease their ICP or what? So the more agitated they are, the more adrenaline they're putting out, the higher their ICP is going to be. If you can calm them down, that's great. You always run the fine line balance mm -hmm. that I do of how much do you calm them down before you take away their respiratory yeah. drive. So, yeah, no, I certainly would treat them. Blood on the brain is super agitating. It can cause seizures, and if they're not seizing, it might be violent, even when they're a perfectly calm person usually. Mm -hmm. Benzos or fentanyl, definitely a great treatment. Okay. <coughs> Blood pressure control for me, so a lot of these patients that rupture an aneurysm, that they have systolics in the 180s, 200s, 220s, 240s. So you'll often be taking my drip. Usually we're picking that carotene because it's fast on, fast off. Um, if they get hypotense, you want to stop the drip. You don't want to let it keep running because then they're going to stop the feeding in the brain. One of the things that I'll do that y'all don't need to worry about too much is if they're anticoagulated, so they're on Coumadin or Xeralta and they have a big bleed, we try and reverse that propensity to bleed. So I'll give them medication. So vitamin K is a shot. PCC is four factors in the clotting, uh, clotting cascade that will try and make them more prothrombin about it. Let them actually form a clot so they stop an active bleed or fresh frozen plasma. The only one y'all might transport with is FFP, and it takes a little while to infuse. You just let it run in. That's pretty much everything I got. Any questions, and I'm happy to discuss anything at all. Cool.
I like to teach anytime you'll run into me at Carson Valley. If y'all have questions, if you want to hang around and not get back on duty for an <laughs> extra five, ten minutes, I'm happy to talk, I'm happy to discuss management, whatever. I don't know how my other docs are because I've only been here since August, but happy to let y'all hang around and try for a second ID if you need it. What Whatever you want to learn, whatever you want to practice, the better y'all are, the better care I'm going to be able to give. So, for some of those like in the card I don't think we can take that on the drip. Okay. Um, and I don't think that we can take FFP okay. or blood. Gotcha. Um, is you there end up with a flight crew? Yeah, but okay. we run into that issue before of yeah. um, there's something that we need to take and it's out of our scope. Like yeah. I know blood's out of our scope. Okay. And the carbine is also. Okay. I mean, there's even a little bit like with a nitro drip that yeah. we're not. We're trying to get that changed yeah. right now to where we can take some more stuff. Um, but what, and I know you've only been there since August. Yep. And this might be something for your medical director, but what are the chances of us, like if the flight crew is busy, of us grabbing a nurse? I know you guys are short staffed yeah. as it is. Um, do you guys ever have enough available to send a nurse with us? Probably depends upon the hours. If it's before midnight, there's mm -hmm. a good chance that we probably could. If it's after midnight, I get down to two nurses and right on one, it's pretty scary. Yeah. So I think between the hours of 12P to 12A, okay. good chance. Okay. Before that, if you, Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just something. For all, I mean, for us to keep in mind, for you too, there's a lot of, we're in the process of getting new protocols yeah. put out. We're going to have a defined list of what we can and cannot take, and we'll get that. Cool. But like right now, I mean, I know we can't even hurt you know, blood, okay. so we're glad not. Yeah, that's good to know. I've always been in a system where it's primarily paramedics and mm -hmm. big city. <coughs> Transport's a little bit different. I'm adapting to yeah. what we can and can't do out here. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I hope to do is I stay around longer is push for y'all to have slightly bigger scope. Because I do think there's a lot of you transport safely yeah. with, you know, a little education. And our new medical director is very on board with us having, being able to do more. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the moment, probably for the next few months, yeah. we're a little bit limited on what we can and can't take. So, um, hopefully that will change. Yeah, good to know. You know, right now it's the end of part of them trying to kind of look at them in by our therapy and stuff. Okay. It's you now. I actually need to read up on what you can and can't. I have to rely on the clerks to tell me we're all, which way we're going to do it. We're all pretty good about if we get there and it's something that we can't take, that we'll let okay. me know that we can't take it. Um, yeah. And we can always call our battalion chief and get permission to take some if it's, you know, like that life or death thing where this person yeah. really, really needs to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's with the risk. Yeah, yeah. Just like you again, yeah. gotta protect our license. Yeah, yeah. no, I so. completely understand how this. And I apologize in advance if I call y'all and it's something you can't transport. Oh no, I'm still learning too. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. All right, thanks guys. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.